Salvation Now podcast, where you'll discover and be equipped with keys from the Word of God that will pave the way to God's unlimited blessing in your life. Now, here's your host, Evangelist TJ Malkanji. Gifts of the Holy Spirit, and specifically the spiritual gifts explained. The definition of these gifts, that's what we're going to get into today. Uh, before I do that, let me just read where we started on Tuesday out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. The Apostle Paul goes into these next three chapters, which, by the way, I'll remind you that the Bible was not divided by chapter or verse when it was written. The Bible is... Uh, the letters of Paul are continuous letters. There's no division, chapter and verse. And so it would do you a great service if you read chapter 12, 13, and 14 as one unified thought of Paul and not three different thoughts that Paul has uh, that seemingly you know, are pulling away from each other. They're actually, it's a very unified thought because oftentimes when people read chapter 12, 13, and 14, they, they slip up on chapter 13 because Paul starts to talk about love. And he talks about how if we have the gift of tongues, and if we have prophecy, and if we have faith so as to move every mountain before us, but we don't have love, we're nothing before God. If we give all of our goods to the poor, and we give our bodies to be burnt at the stake, but we don't have love, we're nothing. And so people, oftentimes, in a mistaken, mistakenly, they take that to mean that the spiritual gifts are good, but ultimately, if we just love one another, we wouldn't need spiritual gifts. But that's not what Paul's saying. That's not Paul's thought at all. Matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. He's saying that chapter 13, the love chapter of 1 Corinthians, is essentially how the spiritual gifts are amplified in our meetings, that if we don't have love, these gifts will not function properly. And if we don't have unity, these gifts will not come to the profit of the church or benefit the church. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, we'll read it in a couple of minutes. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the purpose of these gifts, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each man for the profit of everyone. The gifts of the Spirit profit you. The gifts of the Spirit bring increase. The gifts of the Spirit are designed to help people and not just help us on a co uh, congregational level, as in in church only, but these gifts can actually give you personal edification. These gifts can provide personal value to your own life. And I believe that the Lord, no matter what you're called to do in life, whether it be business, government, education, uh, a doctor, uh, an accountant, a business owner, a landscaper, a contractor, or a minister, no matter where the Lord places you, these gifts will give you a heavy advantage in life in what you do and will set you head and shoulders above everyone else. These gifts distinguish Christians because it gives us a supernatural edge in everything that we do. And I, you know... Talked about it on Tuesday in, as an entrepreneur. If you're a business owner and you're going out to hire someone, what better asset to have than the Holy Spirit telling you things that you can't really read off people, but things about the human spirit that might be in the people that you're interviewing that will guide you away certain people and guide you towards certain people. That person's to be avoided. They have a Judas spirit. They're going to steal from you. All right. I got that check in my spirit. I'm not going to hire that person. I'm going to hire this person that I, I get a good check in my spirit for. You know, Jesus looked at Nathaniel in John chapter 1, and the first thing he saw was an um, Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit, there's no guile. Essentially, Jesus was saying, you're a good guy. You're a trustworthy person. You're a faithful person. You're not someone that's going to mess me up. And so, you know, even in marriage, you know, you're looking to marry someone. You're looking to get into a relationship. What better thing to have than the Holy Spirit's uh, gift of discerning of spirits where you can literally discern a human spirit that you don't have to go through? 
you know, heartbreak. You don't have to go through that, you know, that person's bad news, that person's shady, that person's not faithful, that per whatever it might be. You can avoid certain relationships, and then God guides you into proper relationships. So what happened to me. When I met my wife, it was an operation of the discerning of spirits that led me to her. Because when I saw her, I never talked to her before, I saw her, and I immediately felt in my spirit, that is a, the Lord speak to me, that is a woman who loves me more than you do, she prays, and she knows how to worship me. And that's the woman you're going to marry. So you had essentially two things happening there, which we're going to get into the definition of these gifts in a more uh, detailed manner. But I essentially, when the Lord said you're going to marry her, that was a, a, a word of wisdom. The Lord was showing me the future. The Lord was unraveling the hidden wisdom of God that I didn't know. He was revealing to me the hidden plans and purposes that God had for both of us. And then when the Lord spoke to me that she was a woman that loved me, loved God more than I did, and that she prayed more than I did, and that she worshiped God more than I did, that's, that's a discerning of spirits. I was able to discern that is a woman of God. And here we are, nine years later, married. Actually, it'd be like 10, 10 and a half years later, but nine, uh, July will be nine years married. And uh, I'm telling you, I, I didn't miss it. I know for a fact that the Lord drew that carry to my life, and I have peace in that. And I've never, we've, not that we've never, you know, had little petty arguments and stuff, but we've never had, we've never had a hard time in marriage. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm not saying that to, to boast or anything. I'm just telling you, you can try and navigate through life your own way, or you can subscribe to the heavy advantage that we have uh, through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the functioning of these gifts in us and through us to set us head and shoulders above the rest so that we don't have to go through a constant struggle or a constant, you know, uh, kind of like when you're riding a bike and you didn't grease up the gears, and you're riding, but it's hard and it's tough, but then you take the WD-40 and just grease it all up, and it just, it rolls smoother. It, it, it moves smoother. It, it's easier. Things, it's facilitated. That's what the Holy Spirit does for people. He's the helper. I say all that to say that all of these gifts, these nine gifts that we're going to define today, are there to profit you. They're there, they're there to help you increase. They're there to... To, to help you in practical things in life. You know, a lot of people, they pray about God's, you know, we need the power of God. We need the fire of God. Well, what does it look like when the Holy Spirit actually shows up? We need the Holy Spirit. Great. What does it look like when the Holy Spirit is there? These gifts allow us to see how the Holy Spirit manifests in our lives. These are the nine. You know, instead of saying gifts of the Spirit, let's say it this way. These are the nine main ways the Holy Spirit manifests His power in and through us. Instead of calling it gifts or anything like that, let's just say it this way. These are the nine operations of the Holy Spirit in our lives. These are nine ways we can discern that the Holy Spirit is doing something. These are not human abilities. These are Holy Ghost supernatural abilities. And I'm going to pause there and explain that for a second. Because for a long time, the gifts of the Spirit were naturalized. The word of wisdom, he was smart. The word of knowledge, he had the ability to retain knowledge. He had a sharp memory. The gifts of healing, he had a, a drawing towards the medical field. Working of miracles, he was scientifically uh, loaded in that he, he was an engineer, he was innovative, he came up with ideas. Thomas Edison, the light bulb, he, that man was, was a, a worker of miracles because he, he, he brought a, an invention to the human race that it's like a miracle of modern science. And so that's what they, they relegated it to. They naturalized all the gifts. The discerning of spirits, it was just, you knew how to, you, you had the gift of discernment. You know, you, had, you were wise. You understood things better. No, that's not. None of these gifts are natural in the least. All of them could not be accomplished without the supernatural empowerment of the Spirit of God. That's why the Bible says concerning spiritual gifts. The Greek word is pneumatikos, which means the things of the Spirit. They're not the things of the human mind. They're not the things of uh, the brightest minds. 
They're not the things of uh, science or any type of natural flow of things. These are the things of the Spirit. Concerning the things of the Spirit, I don't want you to be ignorant. What does that mean? I want you to know about them. I want you to study these things so that you can be approved, a workman who need not be ashamed. I want you to be heavily informed about these things so that God can use you. These gifts never fell upon anybody at random. Nobody ever just jumps into a healing ministry. All of a sudden, people are getting healed all around them, and they get interviewed, and they say, I actually don't know how I have a healing ministry. I never even wanted a healing ministry. This stuff just started to happen at random. That doesn't happen. These gifts do not fall upon the uh, apathetic. These gifts do not come to those that are just Coasters in life, these gifts come to people who, like Paul says, are earnestly coveting and desiring the greater gifts. They don't come to just, you know, Lester Summerall says it this way. These gifts will not come to people that aren't people of action. People of action. I want to do something for God's kingdom. I want to be better used in what God's called me to do. I want to... Get in the flow of the Holy Ghost and truly partner with the Holy Spirit in what He's called me to do on the earth. And so I'm going to put my best foot forward and my best hand forward. And those are the types of people that the Holy Spirit partners by partners in their life by distributing these gifts so that they can have a supernatural advantage in everything that they do. So these gifts do not come to people that are just sitting on recliners or you know those uh, rocking chairs these aren't rocking chairs gifts these are gifts that are distributed to people that are on the move and so paul says i don't want you to be ignorant you know that you were gentiles at one time carried away to these dumb idols however you were led therefore i make known to you no one speaking by the spirit of god calls jesus a curse no one can say jesus is lord except by the holy spirit now verse four is where paul gets in to these nine gifts And I want to make this very clear to you. No matter where you are on planet earth, because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, Psalm 139 and verse 7, where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? Nowhere. Because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, these gifts will function anywhere on the earth. There's no geographical restraints as to where the Holy Spirit will manifest. He does not just move in the environment where we have stained glass windows, the electric guitar playing, a beautiful violin stroke in the background, and uh, smoke machines and fog machines, and uh, just the perfect atmosphere conducive for people to get emotionally steered. The Holy Spirit does not just function in that environment. Matter of fact, if you read the book of Acts, there was never an environment like that where these gifts function. It was in the marketplace. It was in school. It was in the city square. It was in the Arepagus in Athens where Paul begins to preach and there's a manifestation of the Spirit of God in that place. Every one of these gifts, you look at Jesus' life. He's just walking to Jairus' house to heal his daughter or raise her from the dead and a woman touches his garment and gets healed. That's a function of the gifts of healing. One of the gifts of the Spirit. One of the power gifts. And it was just him walking on a main road near uh, wherever he he was. Near uh, Galilee or wherever he was. Jerusalem. I don't know where he was at that point. But he was just walking. And so if these gifts only function where the atmosphere is churchy, then they're not much much gifts or, you know, they're not... uh, There's not really an appeal to me. But when these gifts, you start to see them function in a crack house. When you see these gifts functioning in a crusade environment, in an inner city park, where you have prostitutes coming like it did when I was in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and we saw people get healed and people get delivered, where we were literally just in an inner city park with trees all around us, cars driving past us, people honking horns, Music blaring. It didn't matter. 
Because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, these gifts will function anywhere that you are. Anywhere. I was in a park in Jackson, Tennessee in the month of October or November last year. And we did a little outreach uh, during the Saturday afternoon while I was there for a weekend. And we went to that little park that was in the projects of town. And there I, I started to have words of knowledge for people. There was no fancy music. There was no great worship team playing in the background. It was literally just me and a microphone in the projects. And they function. Because the Holy Spirit's omnipresent, they'll work anywhere. And because the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, all-powerful, there's nothing these gifts cannot accomplish. There's nothing they can't do. There's no miracle the working of miracles can't produce. There's no healing the gifts of healing cannot bring. There's no incurable sickness. There's no hidden knowledge that the word of knowledge cannot bring forth. And so these gifts can literally do anything that God can do, and he'll, they'll do them anywhere that God is present. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And who's qualified to these gifts? To be used in these gifts? Is it the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher alone? No, absolutely not. Acts 2.38, the Bible says that the gift of the Holy Spirit will be given to all who call upon the name of the Lord, to your children, Peter said, to as many as are far off, to as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. As many as call upon the name of the Lord in repentance and faith, Peter himself said, the gift of the Holy Spirit is to those who call upon the name of the Lord, even to those who are far off. Meaning it's not just for the first century Christians, it's for the 2024 Christian. Because you have a whole movement in Christianity now that says these gifts cease with the death of the last apostle and that we shouldn't, see, uh, we shouldn't seek to sh uh, be used in this manner. We shouldn't seek to be used in these gifts. We shouldn't, that these essentially fell off when Paul breathed his last breath. But there's nothing in the Bible that says that. And you know what scripture they use? They use 1 Corinthians 13. When that which is perfect has come, then this which is imperfect will be done away with. And they seem to think that that perfect signifies the advent of the New Testament canon. That when the Bible is finally formed, we won't need the gifts of the Spirit. But that's foolish. Because Jesus was the Word made flesh. And He needed the flow of the Holy Spirit to convince His generation of His deity. Jesus was the Word of God. Everywhere He went, the Word made flesh. Everywhere Jesus went, the Word went. And the Word Himself relied upon the operations of these gifts to see people saved, to see people delivered from the powers of darkness. And so if Jesus himself, who was the Word, needed the Holy Spirit's operation in his life through these gifts, we are foolish to think that we can live remotely any type of similitude of lifestyle that Jesus had without these gifts. Jesus himself said, Unless these people see signs and wonders, they will never believe. They'll not believe. So these gifts are there to help us. They're there to help us in our own personal lives, and they're there to help us in the building up of the church in our generation. And I'm going to tell you this. In every generation of Christians, to reach that generation of unbelievers, we need a fresh move of God. We can't rely on what God did in 1786. We can't rely on what God did in Smith Wigglesworth's life. He's dead. He's in heaven. He's at rest. We need a fresh move. We need a fresh demonstration of these gifts. If we're going to see God move on the earth and we're going to see sinners come to Christ. These gifts are always going to point people to Jesus Christ. They're designed that way. They're designed that way. And isn't it foolish, you know, we are in, essentially right now, we are in the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. The Old Testament was the dispensation of the Father, where you see them appealing to God the Father. The New Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have the dispensation of the Son. Jesus Christ, in those four books, brings forth uh, the mind and purpose of God and ultimately the redemptive plan of God on the earth. 
He dies. He rises from the dead. He goes to heaven. He says, I'm now sending you the Holy Spirit. And so since the book of Acts till now, we are in the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. And in the dispensation of the Father, oftentimes you saw the Holy Ghost come upon certain people at certain times. We can see, and we'll get into it, uh, Old Testament evidence of these gifts being in the lives of people functioning through Old Testament saints. We see Elisha function in the word of knowledge more than anybody in all the scriptures. So if the Holy Spirit functioned in the dispensation of the Father and the Holy Spirit functioned in the dispensation of the Son, why do we think that he's going to function any less now that we're in his own dispensation? Now that we are literally in an era in the timeline of God, God that is unique to the Holy Spirit. Why would he work less and move less in other dispensations? Sorry, in this dispensation than he did in other dispensations. If we've seen the Holy Spirit move in other dispensations powerfully, we ought to expect to see him move greater in this present dispensation, which is unique to him. Those who say that God cannot do today by the Spirit what he did in the gospel days or what he did in Elisha's day, in Isaiah's day, they don't know God. Like Lester Summer always said, we are not eating leftovers in a feast. We're taking in the whole menu. Hallelujah. I love that. We're not taking in the leftovers of what God did and we're getting to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. No, we get access to the entire menu of heaven, the gifts of the Spirit included. Hallelujah. So, let's go through, and we're going to read them now, different categories of the Holy Spirit and what these gifts are and their definition biblically. You know, these gifts, I said it on Tuesday, they're weapons, they're weapons, supernatural weapons God gives us to destroy the works of the devil everywhere we go. Make sure that we are always triumphing. Could you imagine letting, uh, you, you get put on a football team, full contact, and you don't get any equipment, and you get thrown out as a running back. You're going to break your, you're going to break your body. I remember in high school football, there was a guy who didn't wear any equipment, and I tackled him, and I'm not big, but I run fast. And I tackled him, and I popped his collarbone right out of his chest. I didn't do it on purpose. He just didn't wear any equipment. And that's what it is to, go to, to live life without the gifts of the Spirit. You're living life without the armory, the spiritual weapons that God has given you so that you're not a victim in life, but you're, you're one that's endowed with supernatural equipment. So not only do you never get hurt, but you're, you're the one on the offense. Because these weapons, these gifts are not just defensive weapons. Most of them actually are offensive weapons. They're there to subdue. They're there to empower you to take over. They're there to empower you uh, to destroy the works of darkness. So it's foolish to live life without hungering desperately for these gifts. But I know that there's people that are hungry that are watching me right now, or else you wouldn't watch me. Ryan, Sunshine, Nathaniel, Sierra, and everyone else that's watching on YouTube and on, on Facebook, and those that'll watch on the replay, you're hungry. You know life's more than just flesh and blood. You know that God is spirit. We worship Him in spirit and truth. And if God is spirit and is a supernatural God, then I'm, I refuse to live life in the natural flow of things. I refuse to live life on a natural frequency when God has invited me to come up higher. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to write that in the comment section. I will come up higher. I will come up higher. Why live on the natural frequency of life when God said, come up higher? Come up higher. He's inviting you to a supernatural way of doing things in life. So let's find out, what does that look like? Number four, verse four, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. You should highlight the same Spirit in your Bible. Because you have people that see a miracle take place, and what do they say? That's a demon. Be careful, oh foolish one, to label something that God is doing as demonic. 
For you tread dangerous waters and you come dangerously close to the line of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus cast a demon out of someone and they said he cast out demons because he is the ruler of demons. And Jesus said, listen, you want to mock the Father and blaspheme him, it'll be forgiven you. You want to mock the Son and blaspheme him, it'll be forgiven you. But if you mock the gifts of the Spirit, you mock the Holy Spirit and the person of the Holy Spirit, you are in danger of committing an unpardonable sin. And so when people label what we see here as a gift of the Spirit as a demonic working or a satanic function, you are essentially in danger of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit is like the sensitive member of the divine trinity. For some reason, the Father and the Son are very sensitive about what people say about the Holy Spirit. They said, when you talk ill and about His working, you are in danger of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is, according to Jesus, an unpardonable sin. Now, if you're watching me right now and you're saying, I feel like I committed the unpardonable sin because one time I saw something happen and I kind of like didn't know what was going on. And I said, I don't really believe in all that. Did I commit the unpardonable sin? No. The unpardonable sin is literally to take it upon yourself to be like a militant activist against the move of the Spirit of God. So to not understand something and say, I don't really believe in that, that's not the unpardonable sin. But to start a blog where all you do is criticize miracles, criticize the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and criticize people that operate in those gifts, you are very much dangerously close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, I never criticize anybody. I never criticize anybody. Uh, or I'll never judge anybody. I, that's between them and God. But those that take it upon themselves to literally be a militant activist against the gifts of the Spirit are dangerously close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So it's better when you don't understand what God's doing or you don't understand what's happening to just keep your lips sealed. You know, the first time I saw someone laugh in the Spirit, I didn't know what was happening, but I kept my lips sealed. I didn't I, I didn't say something in ignorance that would have got me in trouble. When you don't know what's taking place, the best thing to do is to follow the writer of Proverbs' advice. The Bible says that whoever keeps his mouth shut when he doesn't know what's going on is wiser than a fool. It's better to keep your mouth shut than to open up your mouth and let everyone know that you're a fool. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. The same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities or operations, but it is the same God who's working all these things. So what do you see here? Different gifts, different ministries, different operations, same Spirit, same Lord, same God. What does that tell you? Not every ministry is going to look the same. The ministry of Smith Wigglesworth was different from the ministry of John G. Lake. Smith Wigglesworth loved punching people. And when he did it, cancer left and tumors fell off people's body. Uh, John G. Lake would just lay his hands on people. The result was the exact same thing. The tumor left, the cancer left. The operation was different. So there's different operations, but it's the same God. And just because one ministry's operation looks different from another ministry's that maybe you're more familiar with, it's not opportunity for you to say, well, I don't like the way he does that because I saw brother so-and-so do it this way, and I believe that's the only way God does something. No, brother, sister, friend, you are too finite in your brain to conceive all the variety of ways that God can operate the same exact gift you're too finite in your brain, in your mind, in your imagination to limit God or to come up with every way God moves and every way God uh, can bring about a miracle. You look at William Branham. William Branham spoke very softly. He would cast demons out like this. Teal Osborne was very much the same thing. I command you to have your eyes, eyes open right now. And the eyes would open. He'd put his hands and deaf ears Deaf ear, come open. 
for the glory of God. He would cast demons out, come out in Jesus' name. He was very calm, cool, collected. Matter of fact, when he ministered healing, he very rarely would lay hands on people. He'd have them take their right hand, put it on the diseased area, and he'd pray this mass generalized prayer, and people got healed all across. But then you have other people that would lay hands on every single person that showed up to the crusade. Diversities of operations, but it's the same gift, it's the same Lord, and it's the same God, and it might be the same function of ministry. They were all evangelists, but God operated differently through them. God will use your uniqueness to get the job done. God will use your uniqueness. Uniqueness is not an enemy of God. He's wired you very specifically, and he'll use that specific wiring to do things in various ways. So you come into danger when you start to, I saw God do that when I was younger, and so if healing's ever going to take place in a meeting, it's got to look exactly the way I saw it. It's foolish. Jesus, you know, even in Jesus' life, he didn't minister healing the same way every single time. One time, he tells the centurion, go your way, your servant is healed. Didn't even see the servant, didn't even go to the house, didn't even, never had any eye-to-eye -eye contact with the servant. But the guy got healed. Then you have a guy that comes to him that's blind. What does Jesus do? Spits on his eyes. Then you go to another person, and uh, he's deaf and mute. What does Jesus do? He spits on his finger and puts his saliva on the man's tongue and into his ears, and the guy's ears come open. Then the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus didn't do anything. She just touched the hem of his garment, and healing flowed into her. So you see, there's all kinds of different manifestations of the same gifts. Same gifts. So there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit, and here's where Paul ties all these things. Different gifts, different ministries, different activities. But here's what all the manifestation of the Spirit is going to bring. It's always going to give increase. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. I've never seen a person flow in the gifts of the Spirit and then go backwards in life. I've never seen someone operate in the word of knowledge like efficiently and it, the, it, it like damaged their business or it damaged their life or it lead them backwards or it bring decrease i've never seen a church allow these gifts to flow through people and them stay small the early church, you know, for all those people that say we don't allow speaking in tongues in the sanctuary or we don't, allow, you know, we have specific meetings where we can do all that Pentecostal stuff. But on Sunday morning, we tailor make it so that it doesn't have all those uncomfortable things and all those things that the Holy Spirit does that we really just tolerate. And, and that, in reality, that's how they should put it. That's how they should state their, 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 their heart. That's exactly what they're saying. We, we, we know it's in the Bible. We know the Holy Spirit does that. But he's kind of like the weird, funky member of the Trinity. And we let him loose sometimes. But really on Sunday morning, we're embarrassed of how he really operates. We don't like the tongues thing. We don't like the loudness of, uh, of prophecy. We don't like all those different manifestations. It's not palatable for us, and it certainly won't be palatable for the unbeliever. So we just boot him out of our Sunday services. We leave him one little Sunday a year, Pentecost Sunday, where we let him off the leash a little bit, do what you want, but then after that, get back in the cage. We don't want any of that stuff happening. I want to ask those people, in the book of Acts, where they saw the biggest growth happen, one day, 3,000 added to the Lord. The next day, 2,000 added to the Lord. Then by chapter 14, the whole of Jerusalem is turned upside down. And then the Bible says, these men who have turned the whole, uh, the whole world upside down have come here too by Acts chapter like 20 or something like that. Did they do it through fleshly tactics and earthly, man, uh, earthly techniques, earthly strategies? Or did they do it through the manifestation of the Spirit through these nine gifts. They did it through the gifts. Look at Acts chapter 2. Tongues. Tongues of fire come on, P on Peter and the other apostles and the disciples, the 120 in the upper room. And then by the end of the chapter, 3,000 uh, 3, are added to the church. 
Did tongues hurt the service or did tongues add to the service? Did tongues bring conviction on people or did tongues turn people away? At first it turned people away. But when the word of God came out through Peter's mouth afterwards and he brought clarity to the gospel and the sign gift of tongues, it, it led to evangelism. It led to people getting saved. So this manifestation of the Spirit is not for God to make you weird. And that's where, you know, a lot of people miss it. I don't want to be weird. Because they've been exposed to weird people that try to do these things in their own flesh, and it doesn't come out right, and it's weird, and you did not witness with your spirit. And so that's their only exposure they've ever had to the gifts of the Spirit, and they, they just discard, they discredit the rest of it. I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be labeled as a fanatic. I don't want to be labeled as, a, as some oddball. The Bible says when these gifts were in operation in the early church, nobody, nobody dared join them. All the people held them in high esteem. So even the people that didn't believe, they held him in high esteem. They held the church in high esteem. Meaning it, did, it didn't lead to people mocking them. It led to people being, there's something supernatural that takes place there. And I'm not speaking against that. The same Spirit is given to all for the profit of all. For, so let's get through the definition of these things now. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the same Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Notice how Paul keeps saying it. The same Spirit. The same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. The same Spirit. So what are these nine gifts? Let's get into the definition of them. We have three categories of gifts. If you're taking notes... Write down these three categories of the gifts. Number one category, the revelation gifts, which are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. Let's start with the word of wisdom. Now all these revelation gifts is God revealing a fact to man that could not be known through any of the senses of man. Man would have no way of knowing these things that God reveals by his spirit. Man would have no way of knowing these things except by divine revelation. The Bible says in Matthew 16, flesh and blood could not show this to you, Peter, but my Father who is in heaven has shown this to you. That's essentially the gifts of revelation summarized in one verse. Flesh and blood, it's not me being a psychoanalyst, it's not me knowing how to read people, the discerning of spirits, it's not me knowing how to read people and read their mannerisms, read their body language and stuff, that's not... The, what the discerning of spirits are. The word of knowledge is not me looking at a person, seeing he has kind of like yellowed fingers, smells a little bit like cigarette, and then I start saying, the Lord shows me that you have uh, a smoking problem. You have addictions in your life. That's not what it is. You do not gain knowledge of these things through the senses, meaning it's not something you've seen or witnessed. It's not something you hear. It's not something that you can smell on someone. It's something that the Holy Spirit reveals to your spirit that could not be known any other way except by divine revelation. So what is the number one gift in this category? The word of wisdom. What is the word of wisdom? The word of wisdom is the unraveling of the divine purpose, divine plans, and divine will of God concerning a specific situation, whether present or in the future. Who operated in the word of wisdom? Most of you will know the name Elijah. Most of you will know the name Isaiah. These are the major, these are uh, uh, prophets that were majorly used in the Old Testament. And these prophets, anytime they were bringing forth a revelation of an event that would take place in the future, Isaiah 53, for example, Isaiah speaking by the Spirit, bringing the mystery of the suffering servant, the Messiah who would come but specifically pertaining to his suffering. 
that he would be pierced through in his hands. He would be bruised. He would be whipped on his back by his stripes, would be healed. And God would lay upon him the iniquity of us all. That was actually a functioning of the word of wisdom. By the Spirit, God was showing Isaiah the hidden wisdom of the future, the unraveling of the mind, purpose, and will of God that he would ultimately accomplish in Christ 800 years after Isaiah ever even walked the earth. So all of these prophecies of Scripture is actually not the gift of prophecy, because we're going to get into what the gift of prophecy is, but all those prophecies, these unraveling of the divine, uh, unraveling of events, futuristic events that would take place, by divine unction and divine inspiration, is a function of the word of wisdom. Noah hears from God, I'm going to flood the earth, prepare an ark. What is the wisdom of God? You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that God has made known to us the hidden wisdom. And Paul is referring to what the hidden wisdom was. It was all the prophecies of the Old Testament referring to the advent of Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ and what he would do. So the hidden wisdom of God is the revelation of the future and what he wants to bring to pass. Oftentimes people mistake the gift of prophecy for the word of wisdom because they hear the word prophecy. But there is prophecy in the foretelling of events which is actually the fun. I know this might get a little confusing, but let me make this as clear and simple as possible. There is the term prophecy, which is the forth telling of events when I'm prophesying something. But there is also prophecy as listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which is the edification, the bringing of comfort, and the bringing of an exhortation by the inspiration of the Spirit, and we're going to get the, into that, that part of the category of the inspirational gifts of the Holy Spirit. But they're not to be confused with uh, the English word to prophesy or to bring forth uh, the foretelling of a divine event in the future, of an event that's going to come by divine, by divine foretelling. So it's important to distinguish those two. The word of wisdom is when God unravels the future to a person. Noah hears there's going to be a flood. He prepares in light of it. That is a word of wisdom that came to Noah. And notice how it's a word of wisdom. It is not the gift of wisdom. It is not God uh, giving somebody an ability to study or to know certain things uh, in human wisdom at a higher level than others. The ability to you know, study medical science and develop your wisdom in the area of medical science. That's not what it is. It's not the gift of wisdom. It is the gift of the word of wisdom, meaning it's a fragment of God's wisdom that's given to you. It's always a word. It's a fragment. It's not the full picture. It's a fragment. That's why Paul said we see through a glass dimly, but one day we're going to see the full picture. The word of wisdom is a revelation of the fragment of the mind of God concerning something that will take place in the future. And also, a word of wisdom can be the Lord showing you what to do now. It's the revelation of the mind, purpose, and plans of God concerning something in the present and in the future. You see David in Psalm 22, a messianic psalm. He talks about his hands and his feet were pierced. And he's referring to the Messiah and his suffering at the cross. And if you read Psalm 22, it's an amazing prophetic psalm about what Jesus would do. That's a functioning of the word of wisdom. David, by the Spirit, was seen into what would ultimately take place a thousand years after he ever walked the earth. Where do you see the word of wisdom in the New Testament? Jesus talks about the destruction of the temple. That not one stone will be left upon another. That was a function of the word of wisdom. He was, tell, he was forth telling. The destruction of the temple, the New Testament temple, in this, in which happened in the year 70 AD when the emperor of Rome knocked it all down. And you hear Paul functioning in his gifts when he talks about in the last days, there's going to be perilous times. Men will be lovers of self. Men will be lovers of money rather than lovers of God. There's going to be a boastful people, a people that hold to a form of godliness. He's literally setting up what the environment's going to be like in the last days by the operation of this gift called the word of wisdom. How do words of wisdom come to pass? You can have dreams. 
How, how, how do words of wisdom come to people? Some people get it in dreams. Joseph got it in a dream. He saw the dream of all his brothers bowing towards him, which was something that eventually took place. A word of wisdom right there. The hidden wisdom of God was shown to him in a dream. He was able to see everything take place before it ever took place in the natural. Some people have it by a night vision. Daniel, it was in a night vision, which a night vision is not a dream. A it would have said dream if it was a dream. A night vision is essentially God giving you a vision, waking you up at night, and you see something. He was awake. He was cognition. And so he saw in a night vision the uh, unraveling of the next three, four, five hundred years of empires. He saw, he literally, by the Spirit, through this word of wisdom, he saw kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. And not only that, detailed accounts of it. Names. He name dropped before those people were ever even born. He was name dropping. And he perfectly described the rise and fall of Alexander the Great and the division of the Grecian Empire to, his two, uh, to, to, the, to the four people that would take over afterwards. And so in great detail, this word of wisdom came to him in a night vision. Some of you have dreams. And if you don't, you know, if God starts to give you dreams and you don't take those dreams seriously, God's going to stop speaking to you in dreams. When God speaks to you in a dream, write it down. Take it seriously. Be a steward of that dream. What did Joseph do when he got the dream? He didn't say, oh, that was weird, and went on to his daily life. He told everyone about it. Write it down. Write it down. My wife had a, a dream like this once. She was pregnant. A friend of ours was pregnant. She, the friend of ours was due a month and a half after uh, she was. She had a dream that the same day that she, uh, my wife were to, was to go in labor, that this lady would go into labor. So she called her and said, I had a dream that you went into labor at the same time as me. So take it however you want, but I, I believe it was the Lord. What happened? That day came. Well, at first, the lady said, I, that can't be. I'm due six weeks after you, so it's impossible. Well, the day came where my wife went into labor, and we get a text while we're at the hospital. I think your dream's coming to pass. Uh, my water just broke. I'm on my way to the hospital. Six weeks early, she gave birth. Healthy baby. It was four weeks. Four weeks. She was 36 weeks. Healthy baby. And uh, it was on the exact same day that my wife gave birth. And we were in the hospital at the same time. We actually had great memories built that day. So write these down. Share them. Don't keep them to yourself. John got the whole revelation while he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Sometimes... God will speak to you while you're in deep times of prayer, ter prayer and fasting. When you're in the Spirit, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice behind me shouting like a trumpet sound. So how do these words of wisdom come? It could be by dream. It could be by vision. It could be by uh, you being in the Spirit, and you have an inner witness. You feel like the Lord's speaking to you, and you could even hear the audible voice of God. I wouldn't go out looking for voices. Because that's where people get into trouble. But do pay attention. And God wants, you know, Jesus said when the spirit of truth comes, he's going to reveal things to come. He will not speak on his own initiative. He'll guide you into all truth. He'll take what is mine and reveal it to you. And he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit wants to show you things to come. What an advantage in life. When you, by the Spirit, know exactly how things are going to come to pass, you can prepare in light of it. Like Noah prepared an ark. It led to the salvation. He got saved. Didn't, didn't fall away with the flood. Didn't get swallowed up by the waters. He was divinely preserved because of his access to this word of wisdom. Hallelujah. I'm trying to build into a hunger to desire these gifts. And it shouldn't just be, well, God wants to give it to me. No. no, you should want these gifts. You should want the word of wisdom. You should want to know. Because you know what? When the church backs down from these things, that's when people in the world go to clairvoyance. That's when people go to fortune tellers and all kinds of demonic counterfeits that hurt people and bring them more into bondage than anything else. Destroys people. God wants a resurgence of these gifts in the body so that it can help you on a practical level, personal level, and also on a congregational level. Number two, gift of the uh, revelation gifts, is the word of knowledge. Word of knowledge by the same Spirit. What is the word of knowledge? Whereas the word of wisdom is the revelation of a future event, the word of knowledge 
deals with facts from present or past events. So while the word of wisdom is God revealing the purpose and plan and will of His concerning a future event, the word of knowledge is a revelation of facts that have already taken place or are taking place in the present. Past, present. It's related to a fact that only God can reveal. And the word of knowledge will always meet a need. It will not come forth as some sort of clairvoyance to astonish an individual. Like I talked about on Tuesday, the word of knowledge is not me knowing your bank account number and me having some like, you know, children's magic party type of parlor trick that I pull out of my sleeve. This, the word of knowledge is always given to, br to meet an urgent need, to build people's faith, to show them God hears their, heard their cry, God sees their issue. You know, for example, if I'm ministering to someone who's sick and they didn't tell me that they're sick, but I, by the Spirit, I know that they have some sort of cardiovascular issue or their blood pressure or perhaps it's a pancreatic problem. I don't know. By the Spirit, He starts to show me things about the person's body. What do you think that's going to do to that person's faith? It's going to raise their spirit. It's going to build their faith. Now, not only do they know the theological framework of healing and that, you know, God is able to heal and God wants to heal, but when you bring forth a word of knowledge that's very specific to their situation, that person is going to, is going to have like a, a Superman level of faith, realizing God, God heard me. God knows my specific situation. Healing is not some general blanket statement God made in the Bible. He knows what's wrong with me. He's attending to my case. I, I'm going to believe. I, I'm going to believe I'm going to be made well right now. It does something to a person's faith. These gifts oftentimes are like chains, uh, uh, links on a chain. They're all kind of interlocked and interconnected. One, gifts, one gift starts to pull, and then it, 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 it generates the operation of another gift. You know, you have a word of knowledge come forth, then all of a sudden, the gift of faith comes into someone. And then that gift of faith cues off the working of miracles. And then you have all these gifts working hand in hand, interconnected, to bring to pass what God wants to bring to pass in that person's life. That's why, though I am defining these gifts today, you should never get too preoccupied with what's gift, what gift is that. Because people get into debates and arguments. They, don't, they totally miss the, the part that God healed the person. They're trying to figure out whether it was the working of miracles or whether it was the gift of faith or whether it was the gifts of healing and which part of the gifts of healing because the gifts of healing is pluralistic in its form. So which one it was? And they get so caught up in the definitions and stuff that they miss the point that God healed. We're, gonna get, we're getting through the definitions. We're explaining these things right now. But whether it was the working of miracles or it was a gift of healing or it was a gift of faith, Whatever it was, thank God that it happened. Now we do understand, I'm doing this broadcast to bring an explanation of these gifts so that we can, it's like for example, you know, if, if, if you got enlisted into an army and they laid before you a bunch of complicated weapons that you've never picked up before and they said, pick it up, you're going to war today, we're deploying you right now, you would, I, I don't have any explanation as to how I'm supposed to operate this gift. I don't know how it works. I don't even know if this is the front end or that's the back end. I have no idea how to use this weapon. You're going to be severely disadvantaged. You're going to get shot. You're not going to do well in war. So there is value in explaining these gifts. We're defining the weapon. Here's the spout. Here's the trigger. Here's the safety. We're, we're, we're practically defining these weapons. But at the end of the day, what matters most is that the weapon fires off and there's power in that. So we're not trying to get caught up. This is not for you to write these things down so you can go up to your local Pentecostal minister and say, you said last weekend that there was a word of knowledge. I want to bring some light to you. That wasn't a word of knowledge. That was actually a discerning of spirits. When you cast that demon out, that was, you know, forget all that. Keep to, keep to uh, that which brings edification to the body. Amen. And note those who are divisive in that, fa in that fashion and avoid them. For Just like Paul said in Romans 16, these men do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they serve their own belly and they get caught up in genealogies and words and debates on useless things and they forgot the main point, that we're here to learn about these things so that we can be of practical use for God on the earth. Amen. So, word of knowledge. 
What is the word of knowledge? As I said before, it's the revealing of a fact uh, that has already taken place or something that is in the present day. Where do we see this in the Bible? 1 Kings chapter 19. You see Elijah praying in a cave somewhere and he's complaining to God, I alone am left. Every prophet has deserted me. And the Lord speaks to him. This was a word of, this was a word of knowledge. The Lord speaks to him by the Spirit and says, No, I have reserved for myself 7,000 other people in Israel who have never bowed their knee to Baal nor kissed his feet. So here you have Elijah, who didn't know that there were 7,000 other people. Through knowledge given to him by the Spirit, he now has a revelation that there's actually 7,000 other people in Israel that are faithful to God. And imagine how detailed that is. The, to the number, 7,000. Didn't say 6,486. It said 7,000. And God wasn't rounding it up. It's, it's probably because there was actually 7,000 people that hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. So that's a function of the word of knowledge. God showed him something. that, And what did it do? It lifted Elijah's spirit up. It lifted Elijah's spirit up. And then uh, Elijah knew who to anoint as his, success, as his uh, succeeder in the ministry. He said, you need to go now. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is there plowing in the fields. That, that's a word of knowledge. He's plowing in the fields. He's with 12 yokes of oxen. Go and anoint him as prophet in thy place. You look at it in, in Samuel's day. I mean, look, listen, look at this. This is actually spectacular. I was reading this the other day, and it's, it's amazing. 1 Samuel chapter 10. Listen to this. This is the word of knowledge in the life of Samuel. As he's directing. Because the word of knowledge can bring direction. The word of knowledge can bring uh, guidance. The word of knowledge can, uh, can meet an urgent need. But the word of knowledge is going to do something. Look at what it did for Saul. Saul was looking for his donkeys. And Samuel says to him in verse 3, chapter 10, 1 Samuel, Then you shall go on forward from there, come to the terebinth tree. Sorry, let's start with verse 2. When you have departed from me today, Samuel saying, Saul, you're about to leave me. When you've departed from me, you'll find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. Notice how specific it is. It's not this like vague statement. And look, when God starts to use you in this, it could be that you begin in a more vague way operating in this gift. It could be that it's not as detailed, but don't get discouraged. God's going to sharpen you as you keep practicing these things, as you keep stepping out. God will sharpen you. There was a time when, when I operated in the word of knowledge, I'd call someone out. I just sensed that I had to pray for them and I went up to them and I would just pray what I felt in my spirit and it wasn't very specific but then I touch on something that it was actually in, uh, something they were praying about and so it was a function of the word of knowledge it was a very elementary very basic very um, how do I say it very basic elementary startup level of the word of knowledge but as over time it's grown it's grown. Where there's been times where I was able, I was just in, uh, where was I? North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina. And I went to the pastor, which, you know, you go to the pastor of the church, <laughs> you better pray you're right, because he ain't going to ever have you back. And I said, Pastor, I sense in my spirit the word church planting. And God's calling you to plant churches. Well, I didn't know. He, he looked to his wife and like freaked out. He had just had that conversation now, he's an older minister. He's like in his 50s or 60s or whatever. So you're not really generally getting fresh vision to plant churches when you're 60, you know, going on to 70. But he had just talked to his wife the week before I got there, asking the Lord. They were both asking the Lord for confirmation about church planting. And they felt in their spirit they had been stirred up, even in their 60s. Like, we got to start, we got to church, we got to plant a church. God's moving us into another dimension of ministry. I said, I just sense in my spirit. And all I felt, I'm telling you, I closed my eyes because I don't, I don't like looking at people when I'm about to give a word or something. I closed my eyes because I don't want anything in the natural to phase me. So I closed my eyes and all I can hear thundering in my spirit, I can literally see it spelled out, was church planting. So I said that to him, stepped out, went out on a limb, and he, he broke down. That was confirmation for him. 
So it became more detailed over time. I've been to places where I've, I've called someone out and I've had detailed account of what they had in their body that was hurting them. They didn't look ill. Sometimes I'll tell people, you don't look unwell, but the Lord shows me that there's this wrong with your body. God's going to heal you right now. And the Lord heals. So it, it, it grows. You can grow in these gifts. So don't be discouraged as to where you start out. You can grow in these gifts. Look at where Samuel gets to. When you've departed from me, you're going to find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zalza. They'll say to you, imagine that. Not only are you going to find two men, they're going to say to you, here's what they're going to say. How could Samuel have any ability to control what these people are going to say to him? And they're going to say to you, the donkeys which you have looked for have been found. Now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and he's worrying about you now saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you'll go on from there. I mean, just like listen to how spectacular this is. Anyone that says Christianity is boring don't understand it. They've never, they've never accessed the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen, Christianity void of the Holy Ghost and the flow of the Spirit of God, it gets bunched in with every other religion. But when you get into the flow of the Spirit, things happen that are spectacular, that spice up life, that make life a thrilling thing. Look at the disciples. When Jesus turned to them and said, are you going to leave me? After he said, you're not eating my blood. You have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And a lot of people left. He looked to his disciples. Are you going to leave me also? What was, Jesus', what was the Peter's response? Where can I go? You've got it, man. Where am I going to go? You hold the words of eternal life. Man, I've seen things happen with you in the last six weeks that I ain't never imagined could happen in life, in a lifetime. Where could we go to? It's addicting, man. It's addicting. We just had a guy come into the studio uh, just before this broadcast. My new friend, Anthony Lucio. Licio. And he's like a professional studio lighting production and all that. So I don't know if you noticed, but today the, the lighting is like extra nice. And uh, I, he reminded me when I gave the altar call a year ago, he came up, him and his wife, they got saved. And I was walking by them. And he said, he said, you were about to walk by me and you stopped and you looked at me and I never, I didn't know who the heck he was. This is my first time. I didn't know really of him until like maybe a couple of months ago. And so I, he told me, you stop, you looked at me right in the eye and you said, the Lord's going to use you in media and you're going to have, you're going to affect a change in the media world. I didn't know he had a production company. It's not like he was in there with like uh, uh, his company jacket and it said media all over it. I just felt in my spirit the word media. So I started to speak to him. The Lord's going to use you in the media world. That's a function of the word of knowledge coupled in with the word of wisdom is what God's going to use him to do. But the Lord showed me what he was doing with his life and where God had called him to do. What God, what God had called him to do. You know what that did for him? It pumped him up, man. That showed him this stuff is not, this stuff ain't, this ain't just a book. No, this is living. God's not static. God's dynamic. I don't believe in a God that lived. I believe in a God who lives. Hallelujah. I'm not going to Mecca, Saudi Arabia to go around the tomb of a founder. I have the Holy Ghost in me. This is where people get caught up. Even in Christian worlds, and especially in the charismatic, I want to go to Jerusalem so I can touch the western wall and just feel God's power. There's more anointing in my left pinky toe than there is in all Jerusalem. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't live in an ark anymore. The, te the temple, the veil of the temple has been rent from top to bottom. The Holy Ghost has been released. He lives in me. He lives in you. I'm not interested in wood that's come from the ark of Noah that if I put on my face, all it's going to do is give you a splinter. This is the shroud of Turin. This is where Jesus, this might have been what Jesus was wearing when he resurrected. Great. It, it has no power in it today. There's no healing power in it anymore. It's Jesus is in heaven. And you know what I know something else? Jesus is in me. You know where the power is? Everybody's looking around. Everybody's always trying to pull on some exterior force, not realizing that greater is he that lives in you. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's where people, you have, even Catholics, it's all about relics. 
It's all about relics. I was talking to a friend yesterday. He said when he went to a certain place, he said, I saw the hand of John the Baptist that apparently they have stored up somewhere, which I don't know how they know it's the hand of John the Baptist. It's not like they had a DNA <laughs> database and they took it <laughs> and put, <laughs> they did fingerprints of John the Baptist's hand in Herod's day before they executed him and cut his head off. So I, I don't actually don't even believe it's the hand of John the Baptist. But even if it was, which it's not, they freak out. Because this hand, this hand baptized Jesus. Great. It's not the river Jordan that has power. Because people, you know what people do? They go to Jordan to get baptized again. I need to go get baptized again. The river Jordan has no power. It's the one who went in the river Jordan that had power. The Sea of Galilee, if you take the water and you just, just put it on your head, it's going to give you mental peace because that's where he said, peace, be still to the storm. Oh, hallelujah. It's not the water that had power. It's the one who walked upon the waters that carries power. And Jesus lives in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. And how does he flow through you? It's through these nine gifts. So look at how it happened here. Samuel, you'll go on from here. You'll come up there. There'll be three men now going up to God at Bethel, meeting you. One will be carrying three young goats. I mean, think of how accurate that is. One's going to be carrying three young goats. Another will carry three loaves of bread. And another is going to be carrying a skin of wine. They'll meet you and they'll give you two loaves of that bread, which they have three, but they'll give you two of the loaves of bread which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you'll come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you've come to the city that you're going to meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place, and they're going to have a stringed instrument, one tambourine, one flute, one harp, and they're going to be prophesying. Then the Spirit of God is going to come upon you, and you'll prophesy with them and be turned into another man, and let it be so. I mean, that's exactly how it happened. Not only... Did Samuel, by the word of knowledge, tell him the, the donkeys you've been out looking for, they've been found. Don't worry about it. Your father's not worried about that anymore. He's more worried about you. And now as you go up, all these things are going to happen. Bam, bam, bam. There's going to be three men meeting you. On That's a word of knowledge. Look at 2 Kings 6. You see Elisha, who operated in this more than anybody else. Elisha is divulging the king of Assyria's secrets to the king of Israel. And he's uh, revealing their plan of war, their strategies of war. And every time they try to launch an attack against Israel, they're already preemptively prepared in defense mode so that all those attacks fail. See how the word of knowledge can help you? Imagine being ready for the attack. Imagine being ready for what the devil's trying to do. Imagine, imagine. You know, there's a man of God who actually, we're going we're gonna to put his video up right now because I want you to see this. His name is Evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth Sr. Wait for my cue. Evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth Sr., who um, is a great man of God, who operates in the word of knowledge more than anyone I know. At one, this is not the story he's going to tell, but there's a story he tells, where there were people that were working for his ministry that were stealing from the ministry. And they were in a car, both of them married to other people. They were in a car discussing how they were going to steal from the ministry. And they were on, his, on their way to his house. When they opened up the door, Evangelist Ted, while they were on the way to the house, Evangelist Ted had a, a vision where they were in the car and he saw everything they were talking. It's like his eyes were there in the car with them. And so when they knocked on his door, he opened up the door and he said, didn't my spirit go with you? He said, you've been planning this, 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 and this. You're both fired. And secondly, you're both married. You shouldn't be in the same car at once together. And he fired them and they repented before the Lord and they had a holy fear of God. They didn't want to be Ananias and Sapphira of the 21st century. They repented right on the... So just to give you an idea of the level of minister that you're about to see. But here you have him here pinpointing specific problems with a woman in his service. So we'll play this video right now and watch this. Praise God. Stand little sister. Could you hold her Bible and stuff please? Hallelujah. Everybody lift your hands. Hallelujah. Take a step of faith. Now listen, when the gifts of the Spirit start working, it's like throwing a stone in a pond, the ripples go out. As the ripples go out, that means you get a touch, even though I may not be speaking to you specifically. If you'll release your faith, God will touch you. Amen. Hold your glasses in your hand. Pause that. Come back to me.
Do you see what he said? The gifts of the Spirit is like throwing a stone in the pond and then the ripples go out. Meaning, you, it's like when you have a light, when you have your lights on, your headlights on on the highway. The more you go, the more you see. That's how it is with the gifts of the Spirit. You step out in faith, and as you do that, it's, God won't give you everything at once, but all of a sudden, specific words will start coming to you. You'll start, to, and things become more clear and more clear along the way. Keep going. You have two conditions, even though you have glasses, what it doesn't reveal, you're starting to lose your sight in one of your eyes and there's pressure building up. Isn't that right? Correct. True? Correct. I'm having surgery. No, don't even go there. I haven't prayed for you yet. Yes. yes, yes. Look at that. Look at what it's doing for Can you. Can I take my coat off? Now listen, <clears throat> I was kidding. We understand that a great church like this has staff who are taking care of your children. If you're a parent, and you need to get your children. It's all right. But I, 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 I'm going to pray for people for a minute. Yes, sir. Because the Lord told me, I saw you in my room when I prayed yesterday. You will not go blind in your right eye. You understand that? And whatever else the Lord would show, I receive it. I saw you in my room. You feel that? That's the Holy Ghost. I command that spirit of blindness to come out. She shall not lose her eyesight. Can you help her back up? Thank you. Everybody lift your hands. The anointing's here. Also, you've been struggling to get your sugar into the right level and your blood pressure. And the Lord now, I command your blood pressure to go to normal. Sugar level stay in the normal level. The eye is healed. Vision. Someone shout vision. Amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Me. Look at what I did, what I did for, that, for that woman. It supercharged her faith. Not only did she know now that God can heal, but the fact that the Lord revealed to the man of God the specific thing that she was dealing with, she, there was no more room for doubt. There was no more room for doubt. I mean, look at how detailed your eye, even though you don't wear glasses, your eye's going out over here. And then also that thing's tied to sugar diabetes. I see the Lord touching that. Your blood pressure is going to come back to normal. Your blood sugar is going to come back to normal. Everything in like great detail. Now that's an example of someone who, who operates very efficiently in the word of knowledge. But like I said before, and like he said, the gifts are like a ripple. You step out, the more you step out, the more God will reveal. And the more God reveals, the more sharp you are in hearing from God for future future instances. So the word of knowledge, uh, the word of knowledge is it like an, an instrument that God uses to supercharges, supercharge people's confidence in God. Look at the woman at the well. Jesus comes and says, you have, uh, go and call your husband. Oh, the man, I don't have a husband. You're right. You've had five husbands. The man you're now with is your sixth, but he's not really your husband, but go and call him anyways. Oh, Man of God, you've told me everything I've ever known. She went back and reported to the people everything. And what happened? The whole city of, of that Samaritan village gave their lives to Christ that day. Or in that like three or four day revival stretch. All started with a word of knowledge. I remember when I was preaching at a, at a church in Brossard, Quebec, South Shore, Montreal. A lady came. I called her out. She didn't have anything that looked bad with her. She, didn't, she looked healthy. She was a young 21 year old girl and I just said uh, the Lord shows me you have obsessive compulsive disorder now I had OCD and nobody knew I had OCD I, you can hide it unless you live with the person but you can hide it but I was able you have OCD and you're taking this medication here's how long it takes you to get up in the morning and get ready for school and it's been hindering like this and it was like that was probably like the most accurate I've ever had in my life and she had been brought by a friend who uh, was trying to win her to Christ for all these years that they were roommates. And that day, she broke down because she saw this ain't a joke. God is, God, the God of heaven is intimately acquainted with my life and wants to help me. Prayed for her. The OCD broke. She got saved. And the Lord touched her. She's never been the same since. And la like last time I had talked to the, her roommate, she was still serving the Lord. All that happened with an encounter with the Holy Ghost. So... Third, man, we don't have enough time to go th through all this. 
Maybe I'll just do maybe I'll just do brief explanations for the next couple and we'll just pick up another time. But the third gift in the revelation gifts category is a discerning of spirits. This is not the gift of discernment. This is the discernment of spirits. What are we discerning? We're discerning several things. The spirit realm, the Holy Ghost, angels, demons, and the human spirit. So essentially what the discerning of spirits is, is when God lifts up the veil that blocks our sight, from seeing into the spiritual reality of things. And we start to see into the spiritual realm. To see angels, see demons, you can discern the operations of the Holy Spirit and Him moving, and you also discern the human spirit. So what does that mean? Any, any person that saw an angel in the Bible or all throughout history, that was a function of the discerning of spirits. God lifted up the veil that kept them from seeing into the supernatural side of things and allowed them to see an angel. When Elisha prayed for his servant that his eyes would be open to see what he saw, and when the servant of the man of God's eyes were open, he saw round about Elisha, chariots of fire stationed all around him. That was the gift of the discerning of spirits. He was able to discern angelic spirits stationed all around Elisha. The Bible says, that uh, I talked about it before, when Jesus saw Nathanael, he was able to discern an Israelite in whom there was no deceit or guile. But if you look in Peter's day, in Acts chapter 8, when Simon the sorcerer supposedly got saved and baptized and was following the apostles, he asked them if he could offer them money so that he can have the Holy Spirit and whomever he lays hands on would receive the Holy Spirit. Well, what happened? Peter looked at him and said, I perceive that you are bound by iniquity and you, are in the, you, are in, um, you have a heart that's not right before God. He was able to discern Simon, though he was able to fool everyone else. Peter, by the discerning of spirits, was able to discern a wrong spirit in Simon the sorcerer. And he said, pray that God forgives you of this thy wickedness and that you repent. He's able to discern something. He, that's right, Irma. He was able to discern his intentions. The discerning of spirits will allow you to discern the intentions of a person. That's an awesome thing. You know, there was a, a lady that walked into... This is an awesome story, by the way. There was a lady that walked in to um, Lester Summerall. Well, they were having a prayer meeting back in the day. And a lady walked in to the uh, prayer meeting... And everyone was praying, and, and it, there was a holy move of God. And this lady comes to the front, grabs the mic to pray Lex, but instead of praying, she says, I'm an evangelist from such and such a city. I've come here to hold a revival. The Lord said that we're to start a one-week revival meeting, and that you're to, you're to receive me for the next week. And it's to start tonight. Well, while she was talking... Everyone, Lester Summerall said it was like this cold, this cold wind just overtook everybody. Whatever heat was in that place, it's like this cold, dead, dry wind just entered into the place. And it kind of like disrupted things. And while that happened, a woman that was on her knees in the front pew gets up, looks at the lady, points at her, says, you're not an evangelist, you're a harlot. From this city, you don't even live in this. You don't even live in, um, in that city you, t you said you were from. You live in this city. You're a harlot from that city. You've told your pimp that you can come here and deceive noble, simple-minded, gullible Christians into offerings. And you've come here trying to prove your pimp that you can make more money in a week scamming Christians than you would if you were out on the streets doing whatever you were going to do. And I tell you, if you don't leave this place in repentance, you will die right here and God's going to take you out. She ran out of that building. So that old woman, that old praying warrior, she got up and by the discerning of spirits was able to discern this woman's wrong. This woman has an off spirit. This woman is not sent by God. And then when she got up to rebuke her, the word of knowledge began to kick in. And she said, you're not from that city. You're actually from this city. And uh, you, this is the conversation that you had with your pimp. I mean, that, that's a heavy hitter. That would put the fear of God into anyone. 
I would have started a week of meetings based off that if I was the pastor of that church, regardless, just because of that. Hallelujah. So that's what the discerning of spirits does. The discerning of spirits will clear out impurity from the pulpit and the pews of the churches of America and the world. The discerning of spirits is one of the greatest tools that God has to clear out impurity from the pulpits and pews of America. This gift will cleanse the churches in our world today more than any other gift. That's why I believe it's, it's the gift that we need most in our churches because it cleanses things, cleanses the pulpit, cleanses the pews. It reveals intentions, motives, and that which is influencing the human. That's another thing it does is it shows you someone's doing something, but what spirit is influencing those actions? Is it God or is it a demon? You ever see those old like cartoons where you'd have a guy trying to make a decision and you have the devil on one side and the, and the angel on one side? Well, essentially, that's like a cartoon way of explaining the discerning of spirits. When you start to see what voice that that person's heeding, they're not flowing with God. They're flowing with an unclean spirit. Hallelujah. The, Howard Carter explained it this way. The discerning of spirits is a gift of the Holy Spirit by which the possessor is enabled to see into the spirit world. And by this insight, he discerns the similitude of God, the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit, the cherubim, the seraphim, the archangels, the host of angels, or whether it's Satan and his demons. The discerning of spirits. That concludes the revelation gifts. Now, we're not going to have time to go through the power gifts and the inspiration gifts, but because I said I was going to explain them, I'm going to go through just very brief descriptions. Power gifts, you have the gift of faith, you have the gifts of healing, and you have the working of miracles. The gift of faith is not saving faith or universal faith. There is universal faith or natural faith, which is the faith a fisherman has when he casts his line. There is the faith... Uh, people have when they get into an airplane and trust the pilot. There's faith the farmer has when he sows seed into the ground. That's natural faith. There's saving faith. That's the gift of faith that God gives you um, when, when you get saved, to believe on the gospel. That's saving faith. And everyone at redemption has access to this measure of faith. The gift of faith, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the spiritual gift of faith, is when you come to the end of your own natural faith and your own measure of faith and the own, your own reservoir of faith that you've built up by the word of God, when you've come to the end of your own faith, it is the faith of God, the God kind of faith, the highest measure of faith, the perfect faith, void and absent of doubt and unbelief, that comes and overtakes you to believe perfectly. And the gift of faith, God gives in times, two times, for protection or for provision. Daniel in the lion's den, faith came on him to be protected no lion ever swung its paw at Daniel. He came out untouched. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, protection in the fire. They came out not even smelling like smoke, and not a hair of their head was burned. That's protection. Provision. You see the gift of faith in Elijah's life. God commands ravens to bring him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. Elijah, by faith, went and dwelt by the, the Cherith brook, and bread and meat in the morning, without error, came to him by ravens. That's the gift of faith in operation in Elijah's life. You, this gift will help you when you're believing God for finances, when you're believing God for, um, for provision, for something, property, whatever it is that you're believing God for in the area of provision, the gift of faith will cause you to with serenity, without panic, without any lack of peace, with serenity, you'll be able to stay strong to the end. Because it's not your faith anymore, it's the Holy Ghost faith. Number uh, two, gifts of healing. Gifts of healing, they're, it's the only gift that's pluralistic in its form because some people, have, um, some people have said that there's as many gifts of healing as there is categories of sickness and disease. Some people say there's 39. If you take every sickness and every disease, you can classify them in 39 sicknesses, uh, categories of sicknesses, 39 categories of illnesses or chronic you know, issues of men. Plagues, pestilences, whatever. And uh, some people say that's why Jesus took 39 stripes on his back to deal with all 39 classes of sickness and disease. And that there's as many gifts of healings uh, and as many categories under the, 
under the, the, the subject matter of gifts of healings. I don't know if that's true. Something to wonder, something to think about. But nonetheless, it is pluralistic in its form. I believe strongly because there are certain people in history that have been used for specific sicknesses. For example, Stephen Jeffries, nearly everyone that came into his meetings with rheumatoid arthritis got healed. Smith Wigglesworth, nearly anybody that came into his meetings with, uh, uh, what do you call it, when you shake, um, what do you call it when you shake, seizures, anyone that came in with seizures or any type of like uh, neurological issue like that, they got healed. You look at a guy who served under Stephen Jeffrey's ministry, he had 400 blind eyes come open in his ministry, nearly everyone that came into his meeting blind. He would laugh because he knew that the meeting was going to be great because the God was going to open up the guy's eyes. So you see that uh, there's plural form of the gifts of healings, I believe, because certain pe people carry um, a certain gift for a specific, specific sicknesses, specific sick, uh, diseases. Now, can God heal without the gifts? Yes, the gifts of healing is just one of the ways God heals. But the best way to get healed is by faith. Can get healed by faith, laying on of hands, can get healed with, you know, handkerchiefs, aprons, cloths, prayer cloths. There's different ways people get healed. But one of the ways God heals is through the operation of the gifts of healing. And I believe it's plural because certain people carry uh, specific anointings for certain issues. I've seen a lot of people with cancer get healed in our meetings. I've seen a lot of people with cancer get healed. I've seen a lot of people that were deaf get healed. And so, but I, I've not seen, I've not seen like a lot of diabetics get healed. Not that it doesn't happen, it's happened, I can tell you testimonies, but I'm saying it's, it's abnormal. Um, when I feel, you know, when Jesus was teaching and preaching, he said the power of the Lord was present there to heal. I believe that was the gifts of healing in operation. And I've felt the power of the Lord be present in certain meetings to heal, and the people... More often than not, they get healed. Where I see them right in testimonies are people that had cancer. John Stafford, there, there you go, healed of diabetes. So it's happened. But um, there's, there's a pluralistic form because there's specific things that God, that God does through specific ministers. Why? I don't know. No idea. You'll have to talk to him about it. And then finally, in power gifts, working of miracles. Working of miracles is when God, like Samson, picked up the jawbone of a donkey, that's a supernatural ability. The working of miracles has to do with the superhuman strength of God overtaking a person to, to do something, to empower someone to do something that could not be humanly accomplished. Example of it is Samson. The strength that came on Samson, that was the working of miracles. Samson wasn't believing God for the army to be defeated. Samson went out with his bare hands to kill, <laughs> to kill the Philistines. You look at uh, Moses. Moses wasn't believing God for the Red Sea to open. Moses took the staff that he had and he waved it over the sea. He worked the miracle. God would not do it until Moses cooperated with him in an action of faith. And when he moved, God moved and the miracle happened. But he worked the miracle. Jesus spat on the ground, made clay, put it on his eyes, and then told him to go and wash. That man went to wash, and when he came back, he came back seen. Praise God, James. That's awesome. My son's finally been healed of his OCD. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. So the, the difference between like the gift of healing, uh, sorry, the gift of faith and the working of miracles, because both can work a miracle, is the gift of faith is God working apart from you. You're not really, you're passive in it all. You're speaking. You either speak. You're making confessions. But ultimately, it's God's, God's doing. Like Daniel. Daniel didn't physically grab the lion, wrap its arm around his neck, and crack all the lion's necks, and finally he climbed out of the lion's... No, he just believed. The Bible says, I, I was rescued from the den of lions because I trusted in the Lord, and he sent his angel to shut the mouths of lions. He, all he did was believe. Jesus looked to the fig tree, he cursed the fig tree, and it withered up. That's the working of the gift of faith. The working of miracles is when you're physically involved in it. And I can show you a clip right now. Matter of fact, let's show it. Who cares about the time? 
A. A. Allen, where he, he uh, works a miracle in the boy they used to call the monkey boy, had no, had no bones in his feet, could not walk, had no bones in his feet, and had also a bunch of other disabil disabilities. But look at what the Lord does. I want to take his coat Allen. off. Look at this child. I wonder if you can fast forward. Six years old. Try fast forwarding to. Um, Can't walk. Where he shows his Helpless. legs. Helpless. Look at him. How many would like to see this that. poor Look little kitty Spaghetti healed legs. tonight? There's Look no at bones that. There. Are you seeing that? Oh my God. There's no Did bones. Did you ever see anything like it in your life? Yes, honey. Poor little thing. <laughs> Look at what he does. He doesn't just pray. He looks at him. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to pray for this baby tonight. I'm going to ask my God. If you can, speak, so to lift the foul curse from this baby. How many believe God will do it? Um, oh, 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 In the name of Jesus, make him normal. Make him whole. Let him walk. Let him talk. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask for the glory of God. Make him normal in Jesus' name. Listen, listen, Richard, look here, how are you tonight? Mm. All right, no. say all right. Mm. <laughs> Richard, how are you tonight? You say mm. fine, mm. say it loud, fine. Mm. Hold him up tonight. <laughs> Let these legs hold him up tonight, Jesus. Oh, God! That's the work in miracles. He had no, you saw it. He was able to twist his legs back like spaghetti, like a cooked noodle. And then he slammed him on the, pl the platform and bang, you see, you, you see that he was able to hold himself up, which he would not be able to do before. And then he started to take steps towards A.A. Allen. That's the working of miracles. He worked a miracle. God worked extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Meaning it's God's power doing the miracles, but he's using our hands. There have been times where I've grabbed the person who had shoulder issues. I've grabbed his hand or her hand and I'll yank it. I'll yank it. And it looks like, whoa, what are you doing? But I'm working a miracle. I'm, I'm pulling something. I'm, the Lord's power is doing something, but in faith, I'm, I'm cooperating with him to bring to pass to bring to pass the miracle. So those are the power gifts. And then finally, the last, and I'll go very quickly through these inspiration gifts. You have tongues, interpretation of tongues, and uh, prophecy. Prophecy is inspired speech, whereby the one prophesying is bringing forth edification. You're building someone up, up, building someone else up. What does that look like? You're not going to fail. You're going to make it. God's hands on your life. You're building someone else up. Exhortation, which is good preaching. Which means, uh, you know, direction, guidance. When you're exhorting someone, you're, you're, you're training them to do something. You're educating them on something. You're, 
You're rebuking them for something. You're correcting something. But it's all done for edification and comfort. Prophecy brings comfort. It helps people. It brings a blanket, the blanket of the Holy Spirit upon their lives. Breaks, it breaks off people, that heaviness. It, it, prophecy is an amazing gift. And when someone comes to you with a, a, a litany of problems and they feel burdened down by life and all of a sudden by the Spirit you start to speak life into them. What did God tell Ezekiel? Prophesy to the dry bones that they might live again. You're literally letting dead things come back to life again. Bringing life, bringing comfort, bringing edification so that people are spiritually strengthened to keep moving. That's what prophecy is. Then tongues, interpretation. No, we're not talking about private tongues. We're talking about corporate tongues. Tongues, by itself, Paul says, tongues in a public context by itself actually does nothing to anybody. It only edifies yourself. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But when tongues is accompanied by interpretation, which it's not translation, it's not word for word translation, it's an interpretation. Meaning the interpreter is getting the mind of Christ on what that person spoke in tongues and is interpreting it, meaning getting the gist of it all, bringing forth the, the, the great meaning behind it all. It's not a perfect translation, but it's an interpretation of it. And when tongues is coupled with interpretation, Paul says, it brings forth prophecy. It's equal to prophecy. It brings edification, exhortation, and comfort to the whole body. But he said, if I just come in tongues alone, what does that do to anybody? I'll just be speaking to myself and God. It edifies me, but he said, I'd rather come to you in five words in English than 10,000 words in tongues so that the other person can be edified. So those are the three category gifts of the Spirit. And they all bring profit to the church. I've been in church services. Uh, I remember when I first got saved, it was probably 2012, I went to a conference in Montreal, and there was a tongues, a uh, message in tongues, a company with interpretation. And I'm telling you, it did something for me that day. It was about the return of Christ and the urgency of the times, and it put something in me. When someone is genuinely speaking in tongues by the, by the Lord, accompanied by interpretation, it doesn't disrupt the flow of things in the meeting. It actually heightens the intensity of the meeting and it puts like a fear on people because you, you realize God is speaking. It did something for me. I still remember that. It's 12 years ago this, uh, this year and I still remember the way I felt when that tongues and interpretation came forward and I still remember the, the grace that came on me at that very moment to take evangelism seriously because of the urgency of the times. It did something. It helped me. So these gifts are not to be when the faucet, when the Holy Ghost turns the faucet on. That's not the time to turn it off. Because it's a little different than what we've experienced on Sunday morning. I want things to be dis different. I'm praying for the outstanding. I'm praying for the non-ordinary. I'm tired of the ordinary. I'm tired of the normal. I want the abnormal. I want the extraordinary. I want to see what God did in the book of Acts take place before our eyes. And as much as I want it to happen, God wants it to happen all the more. All the more. We're not confining him to a box anymore. No way. The last days, says God, I'm going to pour out of my spirit on all flesh. On all flesh. And if he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh, how could you be a candidate to be using these things? you got to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come on me. And you'll be my witnesses everywhere you go. What's that power for? You see, some people think the Holy Ghost is like spiritual marijuana. You, you, you take a hit and it's just to get good vibes, bro. Good vibes. Feel like heaven in here. The Holy Ghost is not marijuana. It's not to get you high in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers you for service. To do things. To do things. To affect change on the earth. To work His works on the earth. And so when, God, when you're asking God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's what you're asking Him to, to do to you. Lord, flow through me in an unhindered manner so that these gifts can be unlocked in my life in a way that I would be used as a mighty instrument in your hand to, to bring impact, to turn people to Christ, to be an effective witness of the gospel. While I'm on the earth. Who qualifies for these gifts? 
The Bible says in John 7, 37, Come to me all that are thirsty, and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. For this spake he of the Spirit. The Spirit was not yet given, for Jesus had not yet been glorified. But now Jesus has been glorified, and he said, I'm sending you the helper. And I really believe that the rivers of living water that Jesus spoke about were the nine rivers of the gifts of the Spirit. The rivers of living water. One of the rivers being the working of miracles. God wants to work miracles through you. Oh, wait, me? But I, I don't feel like I can work a miracle. Great. That's what qualifies you. It's not you doing it. You're just lending God your hand so he can get the job done through you. God wants to use you to have his healing power flow through you. God wants to use you to speak prophetically towards others. God wants to use you to allow you to, to, to open up your eyes to the spiritual realm through the discerning of spirits so you can deal with things. Who's qualified to be using these things? Anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord. This gift of the Holy Spirit is to them, their children, to as many as are, are far off. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you get baptized afresh and anew in the Spirit of God. Right now, thou shalt be anointed with fresh oil and your cup runs over. Lift your hands wherever you're at and the Holy Spirit's going to fill you right now with fresh oil from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And these gifts, it's not going to be you trying to operate these things. It's not going to be you manufacturing these gifts or working it up in your flesh. They're going to automatically begin to flow through you without even you knowing it. You say, oh man, I think I think that was a word of knowledge. And it will be a word of knowledge. It's going to flow naturally. It's going to flow automatically. And there's going to be an increased drawing in your spirit towards people that carry these gifts at high levels in your generation. Yeah, a hunger for spiritual things is coming on you right now. A hunger to leave the ordinary standards of living, to come in to the supernatural standard and lifestyle of the believer that God's calling you to in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you're going to be irritated. Just like I got irritated when people came into my services bound and sick and all that, and I wasn't able to help them. I wasn't able to do it. All I could do was give them a good word, but there was no power. The kingdom of God is not in word only. It's in power. And I pray that that same irritation that I had that led me to hunger for these spiritual gifts comes on you right now. In Jesus' name, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, be filled with fresh fire. Be filled. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Come into the flow of the Spirit of God. I feel electricity all over me. Miranda, that's a fresh touch. That's a fresh touch. Rise up, kingdom, crying. That's a fresh touch. The Holy Ghost is touching you right now. Yeah. And these signs and wonders are going to follow them that believe. They will lay hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're going to another level. You're jumping levels. You're jumping levels. You're moving forward. Hallelujah. Stay connected with us by visiting us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by searching at TJ Malkanji. Or visit us online, www.salvationnow.ca. God bless you, and until next time.